Welcome to ETSU Department of Psychiatry's Grand Rounds. Today we have two speakers, Dr. Jones and Dr. Newman. They're going to be talking to us about psychological chronic pain assessment, BHI-2, and the BRQ. Dr. Jones got his PhD from University of Tennessee, Knoxville, in clinical psychology. And Dr. Newman got his PhD at University of Missouri and Columbia in clinical psychology as well. And I'll turn it over to them now. You can probably hear me anyway. Okay, very good. Well, welcome. I'm glad that you're able to attend this morning, and we'll be focusing on a topic that's gotten a lot of attention recently, namely narcotic medication use, chronic pain, and, and those sort of issues. Um, Dr. Jones has uh, been kind enough to come from Knoxville this morning to be part of this presentation. I had heard him at a presentation at the Psycholo Tennessee Psychological Association and, uh, and remembered that and remembered the beneficial effects from my attending his presentation. So I think you will benefit from that. As you can see here, I work locally uh, primarily with Roth Neuropsychology and Behavioral Associates doing outpatient work and covering that uh, Quillen Rehabilitation Hospital. Now, there are several objectives that relate to this, and we will be briefly reviewing the behavioral health inventory, too, which is what I'll be discussing, and Dr. Jones, the brief risk questionnaire, an instrument that he's developed. We will be mentioning some references. You will notice that, however, the full references won't be given till later on at the very end. Also, for anybody who's interested, I have copies of some of the references here. I've also made 10 copies of the PowerPoint slides, paper copies. So if you're interested, you're most welcome to come down here and obtain a copy. Um, we hope to incorporate both a balance in terms of the clinical activity as well as some of the research that's involved in this area. Pain is a uh, very... Uh, common uh, driver in terms of people seeking medical assistance. It accounts for a lot of money, a lot of time. Uh, this mentions several millions of individuals and the cost. In terms of those people who are uh, here locally, many of you will note that the John City Press recently had multiple articles related to this topic. Uh, we also, in July 22nd, uh, the president signed a comprehensive addiction and recovery act that related to fighting opioid use or abuse, I should say. And so it's a national as well as statewide concern, and this uh, presentation relates to that. The last point that I mention is also important to me in that pain does result, obviously, in a loss of function, function in terms of limited activities of daily living. We also want to keep in mind that, in particular, it can result in loss of dreams, things that people hope to do, what they plan to do or want to do, and are no longer able to do. Now, there are multiple psychological tests that have been used in this uh, function in terms of uh, pain assessment, opioid use, We'll be focusing on two of them, uh, but there are others as listed here. The Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory, or MMPI-2, is, is probably one of them, and I believe there was actually a grand rounds related to the MMPI-2 about two years ago uh, that related to chronic pain assessment. But in our case, I'll be focusing on the Battery for Health Improvement, two, which will be abbreviated BHI-2, and Dr. Jones will focus on the, another assessment, of that re brief risk questionnaire, BRQ, uh, in terms of his presentation. In terms of setting, which is important to understand, 
why we use, what instruments we use, you should understand that my setting is primarily an outpatient setting. It is entirely in terms of actually this, this focus. I see individuals referred from a variety of pain clinics and neurology groups, and usually the questions are one of two. It's either the pre-evaluation prior to an operation, namely spinal cord stimulator operation or a pain pump, that's one. And then the second one has to do with continuing use of narcotic medications. Those are the two primary reasons why I see individuals. The vast majority of them already have some clear uh, imaging studies that indicate why they might have physical pain. And this is more of an issue of risk assessment that relates to following pain treatment assessments and getting some a sense of the effect of psychological factors on pain and on their uh, likely response, so especially something called somatization, to what extent do emotional factors impact upon pain complaints. The, uh, I, I should also ask, in terms of questions throughout this presentation, if you have a question, a brief question, feel free to raise your hand and ask it. Does anybody have any questions about that? <laughs> okay. Now Dr. Jones will come and do his presentation. Oh, here you go. Here. There we go. Uh, you charge for the equipment here, you know. <laughs> Press this arrow. Can to I grab there. your handheld? Yeah. Uh, on. On. Okay. Yeah. Great introduction there. Oh, welcome to Johnson City. Um, <clears throat> so my name's Ted Jones. I work in a pain clinic in Knoxville. We call it the good pain clinic, trying to differentiate from all the other pain clinics. <laughs> I tell patients it's the old Geico commercial you don't hear anymore unless you've been living under a rock. You've figured out there's a prescription drug abuse problem going on. And so it's that whole balance of pain treatment, opioids, not opioids, what do we do, uh, that kind of thing. And we're trying to get uh, the middle ground is hard to stake out because there tends to be polar issues going on. Um, so I'll put in a plug for balanced pain treatment, opioids w when necessary. I keep thinking about the guy I saw yesterday, came from an hour north of us up in the mountains west of you all. Um, <clears throat> lifetime cerebral palsy, uh, had 40 surgeries on his brain because he had seizures repeatedly, couldn't function at all. Eventually after about the 40th uh, brain surgery, they stopped his seizures, but now he has continuing face pain and head pain from, from the hit a nerve when they were doing it. And then he also tripped over his own feet and broke his hip and has had a left hip pain for two years. His primary care was giving him hydrocodone, five milligrams, two a day. And then the doc says, nope, I can't do that anymore. You know, I, I, we don't prescribe opioids. Actually, my administrator said, we don't do that anymore. So you go to Knoxville, drive an hour down and, and ask them for your hydrocodone five twice a day. Uh, it's good to get evaluated, but it's that kind of, oh, we're not going to treat anybody with opioids with no dose anywhere that, that hopefully we can find that middle ground. So that's that general plug. So <clears throat> if you do any kind of thinking about controlled substances and prescribing, the Tennessee Chronic Pain Guidelines that came out a few years ago that we were involved in writing said, you ought to use risk assessment instead of just kind of saying, oh, yeah, they look okay to me. Um, doing some sort of, we had it in there, validated risk assessment tool. A lot of clinicians, I don't know if I want to pick on psychiatry, but a lot of people are like, yeah, I can look at them and tell. I, I, I need to size them up and I, my visual, I can, I can tell who's a risky person. And actually the data completely undermines that. You know, you can, it's better to flip a coin than to have clinician uh, winging it for a clinical assessment if you don't use any kind of structured interview. So your gut feeling is really not worth much unless you have some sort of validation in there. So we said use a validated tool and actually use it. It should have some impact. A lot of people say, okay, give a risk assessment tool. They did it, put it in the file. Great, I've done it. Check mark. The auditors won't get on me. 
um, but it actually ought to have an impact on treatment, and we'll talk about how that is. So we want a validated tool that impacts treatment and not just putting a file somewhere. I saw a poster at the American Pain Society this spring, and they did a, a study on the SOAP, one of the risk assessment tools, or the SOAP R. And they said, well, we really, we gathered, you know, 100 patient charts, and they're supposed to do this SOAP, and we looked at, we were going to do the prediction of the SOAP, but we couldn't do it because 80 out of the 100 were not complete. You know, they just handed it to the patient, didn't check whether the patient completed it or not, threw it in the file, and there it was. So when they were doing a retrospective study, 80% of their data was worthless because the patient didn't complete it and nobody asked them to complete it because nobody cared about what the result was. So it's that kind of thing where we need to integrate risk assessment tools into actual treatment decision making kind of things. So, and the guidelines say, yeah, do that. Uh, Got to turn around to do that. And third party payers expect you to use risk assessment results in terms of testing and monitoring. <clears throat> there are, not to go into too much detail, but there are a number of clinics that make their money on urine drug testing. We're going to run a tight ship. We're going to test everybody, every patient, all the time, full panel. We're going to make sure that we don't have any drug abusers in our system. And we own the lab, and we need a drug screen this week and next week and a month, and, and they just test panel on the auspices of we're doing clean, safe prescribing. Well, Medicare says, no, you really can't test every patient every time. That's not medically necessary to do. So risk assessment is going to drive urine drug testing. We all have to do pill counts every time in the state of Tennessee, it's state law, but in terms of drug testing and checking the CSMD, how much you do that should be driven by the risk assessment tool. So there's some impacts to that, and third-party payers are going to begin to get into the act as well about looking at risk assessment and how that ties to treatment. Well, we'll take Ms. Smith. Ms. Smith's a little old lady. She's got documented rheumatoid arthritis. You can look at her hands and tell she's got terrible arthritis. She's been treated by her PCP for a long time. She comes in and says, I can't take it anymore. I can't get my housework done. You know, my kids come over, but they can't do all the household chores that I need to do. So how about some hydrocodone, a couple doses a day, maybe some oxycodone, five milligram, two or three times a day. Primary care, historically, would not drug test her. I mean, known her for years, knew the family for years, went to high school together. So you've helped an elderly person cope with their pain and their functions increased with a little bit of opioids, and so that's a great thing. Maybe. Well, maybe she sells half of her medicine to, to pay the light bill. Maybe she's got a sponsor. Surely to goodness you guys need to know what a sponsor is, right? Somebody comes to you at the dry, at the local uh, restaurant and sees the cane and says, listen, I'd like to sponsor you. It's like a football scholarship for pain. And say, I want to sponsor you. I will pay your way to go to the pain clinic. I'll even drive you. I'll give you 20 bucks to get there on top of the gas. And when you get your medicine, you just give me a third or half and you can have the other half and it's win-win and so I'll sponsor you. And so people have sponsors. The big drug bust in, uh, they closed three pain clinics last year. They found that the uh, primarily based on sponsors, you know, who, when they caught, ratted out everybody else. So sponsors are a big deal, um, and people get sponsored if they have legitimate real-life pain. So they think of it as a win-win situation. So maybe she takes eight or, eight or ten pills a day. You know, who asks her how many she's taking? She takes eight or ten a day and then runs out for two weeks. Um, or a granddaughter visits and helps herself to some of the pills every time, just a little bit, so nobody can really see that it's all gone. Or her cardiologist told her that she's got some heart disease and she really ought to drink a glass of red wine every night. And she's kind of nervous, so she takes Xanax every night. Okay, unless you're doing risk assessment, you're really not going to catch that kind of stuff if you just look at the physical pathology and miss all the psychosocial risk and even the medical risk that's going on. So risk assessment is hugely important. You don't need to be prescribing opioids without a risk assessment tool. Um, there's actually two risks. One is, and the, the literature and the media tend to get it all confused and put it all together. There's two risks. One is risk of overdose, medical overdose. The factors that correlate with that are elderly, sleep apnea, benzodiazepine use, alcohol use, hepatic symptoms, sleep apnea. Um, those are the things that correlate. It's hard to do those kind of studies because actually most of the people that overdose are not pain patients. And so to do a study where you have enough people in the system to track their data is hard. Um, 
But, and so there's no validated tools at this point to check for medical overdose. But all prescribers need to be aware of medical overdose and be thinking of those clinical factors. Uh, but there's no tool to say, oh, their medical risk of overdose is low or high or medium. There's uh, one tool that's the Rio sword is proposed, uh, but it's not validated, and they'll tell you it's not validated. They're using it on the whole VA system to try to get enough data to see what predicts. But then they miss alcohol use because they're using factors that are in the medical record, and alcohol use is not a checkbox on their record. Um, so there is medical, when you talk about risk assessment, one risk is medical overdose. But that's not classically what's talked about in risk assessment. Usually it's behavioral risk assessment. And there are, I think, 10, 12, I haven't counted them lately, tools that assess risk. You know, risk assessment tools, not medical risk. Um, occasionally you'll go to some state guidelines. States will sometimes, uh, other states will put out, these are risk assessment tools, and they'll throw in a cage for alcohol and drug use, or a cage D, I think it is, for drug use, or something that is a, a substance abuse screening, which is not the same as medication aberrant behavior. What you're trying to predict is who's going to mess up with their medicines in one way or the other. Are they going to use illegal drugs? Are they going to run out early? Are they going to overtake it? Are they going to lose it? Are they going to get robbed? And so that's what medication aberrant behavior is and that's what you're trying to predict. And a substance abuse screening scale tells you about substance abuse but it doesn't tell you about medication aberrant behavior. There are a number of addicts and alcoholics that get busted up in car wrecks and have chronic pain. And just because you identify somebody as an alcoholic or addict is not really the same thing as what you need to know in terms of medication aberrant behavior. So there's a number of tools. Um, there's actually one, yeah, I think that last one, the, the sober is a pediatric scale that came out of Memphis because there are some kids with, and we're getting an increasing number of them, who have chronic problems and sometimes opioids are used for them because all else fails and there's really nothing else you can do. And so there's a pediatric scale which goes into lifestyle, family sorts of issues with that. But there's a number of scales. Most people tend to use the ORT and the SOAP, the opioid risk tool and the SOAP. And then people say there's a SOAP and a SOAP R, so the R is revised so it must be better, so let's all use the SOAP R. The SOAP is actually psychometrically better. Uh, but there's a number of scales and there's data behind all of them. When you give you a quick psychometric background, so there's sensitivity and specificity. It comes out of radar theory. If you turn the dial up to be very sensitive, then everything looks like an incoming bomber, but you're going to be right about all the incoming bombers that are coming in. So you have a very sensitive scale, but maybe it overrates risk because there's a few ducks that look like bombers. If you have specificity, then you're looking at ducks and how well can I identify ducks? And if you have that, well, you. Like if I say everybody is low risk, I'll be right for 80, 90 percent of the time, but I'll miss the 10 to 20 percent of people that misuse uh, medicines with that. So you're trying to balance specificity and sensitivity in any kind of test. All the tests that are out there, prediction tests, try to weigh that one way or the other. Um, so I think for clinical purposes, sensitivity is more important. You really want to be sure you're getting all the high-risk people and identifying them. You don't want to miss the high-risk people. If you've got to balance over-testing low-risk people that turn out to be low-risk versus catching the high-risk people, clinically, that's what you need. Payors say, hey, don't over-test, but uh, sensitivity, I think, clinically is the one you want. So you want a sensitive test. I got into all this because it was about 03, 04, we inherited a bunch of patients and the doc said, okay, we need to do risk assessment. You're a psychologist, go do risk assessment. So I go to the literature, grab out the most common items or the common tests, the ORT and the SOAP, started using them and they pounded me week after week. You said this guy was low risk and he's positive for cocaine. You said this guy was low risk and they ran out of meds three early three times in a row. What are you doing? So the tests were not sensitive. I was saying low risk, and there were, it was missing a bunch of people that ended up engaging in medication and aberrant behavior. So we had to do, we had to up our game because we just, you know, I was tired of getting criticized for missing all these people. They don't remember all the ones I got right. They remember all the ones I got wrong in that sense. Um, so I had to get a more sensitive tool. 
we ended up with an interview, the brief risk interview, and that's how we do things now, is we interview with two psychologists every person before they get opioids, and we have a structured rating scale on how that risk is identified, and if they say this, that means this. And we don't give it a number, we give it a level. Low, we actually, for psychologists that get kind of obsessive compulsive, low, low, medium, medium, medium high, high, very high risk. So it's a six level rating scale and we slot people in and that has treatment implications. Um, so that's what we use, but most people do not, cannot, don't have the resources to be doing interviews on every pain patient. Now psychiatry, that's a perfect thing to do because the questions that go into the brief risk interview, it takes five minutes out of an interview and it's probably half of them you're already asking already. Have you been chemically dependent? Well, you don't say, have you been chemically dependent before? You say, how much did you drink? Did you ever used to drink too much? Did anybody complain about your drinking? So it's easily woven in there. Some of the things that our interview has that the classic risk assessment tools don't is, where do you keep your medicine? Well, it's in the cupboard above the sink, up high, where the kids can't get it. Oh, that's good. How old's your kid? 17. Okay, you can probably reach above the sink, so <laughs> that's not a safe place. How often have you been robbed? Oh, all the time. Actually, the case I used before always sticks in my mind because the little old lady was sitting there and I had to do it in the exam room because she couldn't walk all the way to the, to the room. And I was interviewing her and she's, oh yeah, little old lady, risk, no problem. She, her daughters came with her and she's saying, no, I'm, I'm doing everything right. Uh, have you ever been robbed? Oh yeah, all the time. I have my medicine taken all the time. Well, who does it? She does. And the daughter goes, well... They don't give me enough at my pain clinic, so I have to have some. And she takes some too, points out the other daughter. So, and they're very forthcoming. We always think patients lie. They're actually, sometimes you think, do you really think about what you're telling me? Because you're really revealing quite a lot. Um, but theft is a huge issue that we need to be talking about. Diversion is a huge issue, and we need to, medication security is an important thing when you're doing risk assessment. There's a number of people that are not addicts, not alcoholics, not somatosizers, but they get robbed repeatedly or they loan them. Had a lady last week that came in and said, well, I loaned out my medicine and when he gave it back, it wasn't the right kind and they kicked me out. You know, loaned it out. Okay, so theft is like one example of what comes in a, in a brief risk interview, the kinds of things, additional questions that we need to be asking. Um, now, realizing that most people can't do an interview, we came up with the, uh, we came up with the brief risk questionnaire, which is basically a 12 item questionnaire that taps the same content areas as the brief risk interview. So instead of doing a 45 minute interview, it takes four minutes to go through some check boxes and go through that. So it categorizes people into low, medium, and high. It's short, easy to score, easy to read. Uh, it's just check boxes. If you've used the SOAP, it's got this whole rating scale kind of thing, which can confuse a few people. Um, the, the ORT basically historically had check the box if it's true, if it's not true, you leave it blank, which is a terrible way to make a psychological test because if somebody leaves it blank, you say, oh, they answered zero to everything. Like, yeah, or they didn't look at it at all. You really need a forced choice, yes, no, for any decent psychometric test. So the cons is that it may overrate, overrate risk. It may categorize people as too high. And we used it at our population a couple of times. Uh, it needs to be studied in other populations. We've used the brief risk interview on Long Island and it worked real well. Um, but all these risk tools need to be, they've been developed in one place, but they need to go other places and get developed. Um, so that's one, the brief risk questionnaire is one tool out of 10 to use. You know, they all have their pros and cons. That's a quick, I edited out a few of the questions, but you kind of get the feel. Have you ever been discharged from a pain program? Uh, have you ever had to get your medicine from family or friends? You know, we have to put it in that East Tennessee kind of way. Have you ever had to do that? Oh, yeah, I've had to do that. I was forced to. My doc didn't give me enough. Uh, has it ever been stolen? Have you ever spent time in jail or prison? How's your reading? You know, people that don't read well, that's a proxy oftentimes for intelligence. And so if you say, I want you to take your medicine this way, blah, 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 sometimes they get it and sometimes they don't. So that's a factor to look at. Does somebody help you with storing or taking your medicine? Well, if somebody's helping them with their medicine, there's a little more potential for theft. There's also the idea that that person is not stable, competent, you know, enough to take their medicine correctly. So there's, so we, the broad and 
content is broader than most risk assessment scales where you're just looking for addiction. Are they an addict? If they're not an addict, they're okay. Well, no, there's some other things to be looking at. Those are some examples of that kind of thing. How you're going to use risk. Um, so you got your universal precautions, things you're going to do for all patients. In Tennessee, you're always going to do a pill count. You're always going to do a drug screen. You know, for our practice, there are a number of medicines we just took off the table and said, no, we're not going to use oxycodone 30s for anybody. The, the liability is just too much for, the, you know, it's the coin of the realm, as they say. Oxy 30s is just some, we, we just don't go there with anybody because it's just too much of a problem. So those are part of our universal precautions of things we will do for everybody, to everybody, of what's on the table. And then with risk, <coughs> you've got a number of medication options at low risk. As they go to medium risk and higher risk, the medication options decrease. We tend to, or historically, have gone more to long-acting medicines for higher risk people. Now the CDC's really come down on long-acting and a number of other people saying, oh no, the overdose risk goes up, you shouldn't be using long-acting. I think workers' comp just changed it and said, we're not going to pay for any long-acting. It's all going to be short-acting because the CDC said that was a great idea. Okay, well, then you're just tr doubled or tripled the number of doses of opioids that are out there in the community by making everybody take short-acting instead of long-acting. Unclear that that's a good idea, but it's a great cost-saving measure to insurers. But so how you decide what is on the table for high-risk people versus medium-risk people you know, thinking about it, you, you know, there might be some people you want to give Dilaudid three times a day to. There are some people you don't want to give Dilaudid three times a day to. So having within your practice some idea of what the medication options are and how they vary by risk. And then also the monitoring. The monitoring is going to go up based on risk. Low risk people you don't have to monitor as much and you shouldn't monitor so you don't do drug screens every time, every day on everybody. Um, but with higher risk people you do. With higher risk people, you're also going to want to do more referrals. We're going to be referring to psychiatry probably a whole lot. We do for that. And also high-dose opioids. If somebody's on high dose these days, we tend to monitor as if they were high risk, even if they're not high risk, because basically socially they are high risk. Uh, medically, people are going to look at your charts and say, you've got somebody on high dose opioids. What's going on there? Uh, so we treat high dose people as high risk no matter what the risk assessment says, just based on the dose that they have. So that's, now you're going to be at the BHI2, and we can, if we have a little bit of time, we can do that. But that's a quick risk assessment and testing for that. Very good. Okay. Thank you. Okay, you have to say, you don't want to keep that. <laughs> um, yes, go ahead. No, stu no studies on reliability. We've done a bunch of studies. We've done published maybe six or seven or eight studies on validity. And the brief risk interview is the best predictive tool out there. Uh, the brief risk questionnaire seems to be number two. The SOAP, uh, not R, but SOAP tends to be number three because it has a lower cutoff level. So yeah, because we run head-to-head -head comparisons. Give people three tests and see which one does best. So at least we can have comparative validity, which one seems to be predicting best. Um, the CDC, I just wrote an article for Pain Week Journal because the CDC said don't use, it. I'll give you, really give you time. The CDC has said basically, well, we're not sure risk assessment's any good because the tools are really not very good. They only give you 60, 70 percent, 80 percent accuracy. And I've said, no, that's good. 
uh, and I used college hoops. The NCAA March Madness Tournament, when they go through all kinds of stuff. They seed basketball teams and try to predict who's going to come. They get it right about 67, 70 percent of the time, and that's with huge amounts of data being cranked in for analysis. So if we can get a risk assessment tool that predicts 70, 80 percent of the time, we're doing great because that's about all you can do in human behavior is get a rough 70, 80 percent accuracy rate. Uh, so, and there's studies out there I can send it to you if you want that go head to head. But yeah, valid, probably better than the old tools. So they are better than our old tools based on our studies. Let me turn it over and we can okay. do Okay, very good. BHI2. Now, this is a little different than the brief risk questionnaire in that it focuses a bit more on some of the behavioral health, psychological aspects that might impact not simply on medication, but treat, pain treatment response generally. A nice thing about the BHI2 relative to some other assessments like the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory is it has a large normative sample based on pain patients as well as community uh, samples. So you can see comparisons and I'll mention that when we go through it in more detail. Uh, and as I mentioned in my situation, I'm primarily seeing individuals who are already identified as uh, chronic pain patients. There is a briefer assessment called the Brief Battery for Health Improvement too. If you were doing assessments on the medical center as an inpatient, this is something you might want to consider. The problem is that psychometrically it's not quite as good as, as the full length BHI, but you should be aware of that in terms of the, uh, of the uh, uses, depending upon the context that you use. Now, in terms of the BHI, There you go. In terms of the structure of the BHI2, there's, this is primarily normed for samples, adult samples between the ages of 18 and 65 who are being treated for some physical injury who can read at at least the sixth grade level. Now in terms of my work, when I see people, I want to make sure that they're generally reading at the eighth grade level, if they tell me they're not sure, we have a little reading screening assessment we do. So my cutoff is, is eighth grade, but if you read the manual there, it says sixth grade. And as you probably know, grade can vary. I've had people who said they finish eighth grade and they do quite well. I've had people graduate from high school and they can't read at a sixth grade level with a standard diploma. So there can be quite a variability. But that's one thing to assess. If they can't read, then I do another option typically, and that is request medical records from the primary care provider. On this assessment, you'll see 18 uh, primary scales. The whole assessment is 217 items. All of it is an assessment that basically is paper and pencil. And it'll be something like, uh, there's four, four sections, but it'll be something like, strongly agree, agree, disagree, strongly disagree. That's the kind of decision that people are asked to make for these items. The fourth part uh, involves individuals who are currently working. So if they haven't worked in the past year, there's a small section at the very end that we don't give. Um, in terms of the scales, you'll see scales listed above. There's one major section called the validity scale, and there's two subscales under that. And this provides some assessment in terms of, uh, is the person have, uh, are they presenting themselves as unrealistically virtuous? Uh, do they seem to have a normal range in terms of psychological and behavioral health complaints? That's, that's what these scales kind of do. Um, and of course, in my case, besides the assessment results, I also have just finished an interview with the individual, so you get some sense of how this matches with what they're reporting. Then there's a major uh, scale heading called physical symptoms, uh, the, uh, and that's listed on the overhead here. Uh, you will notice several things. This is an area that gets the, at the idea of somatization, to what extent the emotional factors impact upon pain complaints. 
And the muscular bracing, to what extent would the anxiety impact upon a person receiving physical therapy, OT, give some sense of that in rehab settings. The effective scale, another major scale group, it refers to some traditional depression, anxiety, hostility. And then one of the benefits of the full length scale, which the brief doesn't have, are the character scales. The borderline symptom dependency, again, this gives some sense not only to what extent does the pain function in a, let's say, in a positive, quote, positive sense in the person's life. How hard would it be, diff would it be for them to give up being a chronic pain patient? This provides some sense of that in terms of the recommendations. And for my recommendations, they're almost always in a report that's written in a letter format. And at the last paragraph, I'll have the recommendations that will uh, relate to their suitability for spinal cord stimulator or continuing narcotic medic medications or whatever it may be. And that'll be summarized in that paragraph. Uh, and that relates very much to the, the bottom line. So you take the interview data plus the test data. And then the psychosocial scales, uh, from a functional point of view, for me, relate primarily to issues uh, that may relate to trust. I'm going to switch this over here. Well, there we go. OK. These are the scales that I uh, briefly mentioned. Now, there are subscales. So for each of those items that you saw on the previous overhead, the, the physical symptom area, the other areas, each of those has a series of subscales that uh, can be identified Psychometrically, they're not as stable as the larger scales because the number of items per scale is less, and you'll see that in just a few minutes. But there's a number of subscales that are helpful in terms of providing a sense of, of uh, uh, recommendations related to the behavioral health factors. So for example, there is a grief scale that relates to general loss. There's a cognitive dysfunction subscale. To some, what extent does the person feel that they're just not thinking as well? Sometimes people uh, indicate, I, I ask some standard questions related to memory. If they indicate they have a problem, um, I may give them the mini mental status examination. Try to get a, a quick idea of how much of it's related to emotional factors, how much of it might be related to physiological factors. You'll also see on the uh, subscales there's issues related to uh, history of abuse. And almost always, the, the, this correlates very well with the person's self-reported history. These subscales are also important in the sense that it can impact upon um, the extent to which a person is likely to trust their provider. If they have a history of violence, they may be less, or family dysfunction, they may be less likely to be uh, individuals who would trust the provider that they're seeing. Okay. Oh, well, that's probably backwards. You can't read backwards, can you? Oh, that doesn't do it either. has to be with us. And it's a, uh, this is, that did I? <laughs> this is a test. That, it's, a, it's a visual spatial test. <laughs> okay, yay. round of applause please. Uh, okay, this gives some idea of uh, how the interpretive statements are made and what they're based upon relative to the normative sample. You will have noticed in the previous overhead that there were a series of, of slide, or lines, and let me, let me do this. Um, you will notice over here, for example, well, there we go. 
you can see the black uh, diamond and the uh, clear or the white diamond on each of those scales. The white diamond is the representative of the community normative sample. So for example, it's not infrequent that, for example, the overall depression scale will be ele re elevated relative to the community sample, but would actually be at least marginally within normal limits relative to the chronic pain sample. So it's very helpful having that comparison in terms of the community versus the chronic pain sample. And, uh, and as those, statistically speaking, those are given in the previous overhead that I just showed you in terms of what they represent. Because there are terms, namely, highly elevated, et cetera, or low. OK. Now, in terms of some of the statistical issues, as was previously asked about, there have been several studies. There could always be more. But there have been several studies that relate to the internal consistency and test retest coefficients. Uh, they're manualists here, and you're certainly welcome to look at more of a range of that. In general, if you're familiar with the concept of how much uh, variability or variance does it account for, if you multiply that by uh, double it, you'll get a sense of what, how much variance is accounted for in terms of the particular scale. In general, the BHI2 is considered a pretty good scale. Uh, there, there's a group called Burris uh, that does formal reviews, and I'll be quoting them in just a minute, but relative to what exists and relative to the structure, it has a number of strong points. There are test-retest coefficients, uh, and again, those levels of 0.88 to 0.97 are considered very good relative to other psychometric instruments. Uh, in general, uh, there were uh, patients that I didn't separate, although you can if you look at the manual, I didn't separate the, the data here from the uh, general community or patient data, but the coefficients, the reliability are all in, in good stead. The uh, Burroughs reviewers state that it's, quote, respectable concurrent validity. That means does this test measure about the same thing that other similar tests measures? in terms of comparisons with McGill Pain Questionnaire, Minnesota Satisfaction Questionnaire, MMPI-2, and several others. Now, when you get to the subscales, there's, like, of course, a smaller number of items per subscale, and the items can range as low as 2 per subscale to as high as 8. Uh, this results in a, a lower sense of consistency. Uh, the still, the test-retest correlations aren't bad with 0.78, or rather 0 0.76, 0 0.79, but there is some uh, other problem in terms of consistency. Now, in terms of the National uh, Review Center that has uh, individuals who... Uh, provide formal reviews of assessments called the Burroughs Center for Testing Reviews. This, there are two reviewers that have reviewed this, and, and they state, quote, there's strong internal consistency in test retest. This is, does assist people in treatment planning. As I've indicated in terms of my use, uh, it, uh, it relates to whether it backs up, doesn't back up interview data, how does it relate. It helps provide some at least semi-objective uh, sense of what might be recommended. And one of the reviewers quoted that last mark about being one of the best um, instruments available for assessing a, a range of treatment needs to focus on some of the more psychological uh, indication or needs of pain patients. However, it's not all positive. Um, there are some issues that are clearly lacking. Uh, for example, I mentioned the muscular bracing sub the range, and also to what extent is that being their answers there consistent with other sources of information? I, I work uh, where the referrals come from. I work inside a pain clinic, 
And so I'm there. We rent an office within the clinic, and basically 100% of my work is with the same practice. And so all of my patients, they've, they've been seen for a physical, they've been seen, we, we stagger it. Uh, they're seen for a physical exam, and then the nurse practitioners, for better or worse, say, I'd like to give you medicine, but I really can't. We need to go through the process. So go see the psychologist, and he'll decide if you get medicine or not. Yeah. Thanks in, a lot. In Johnson City, yeah. Pain Associates, for example, has a psychologist that's on board that's paid staff there. In my case, we receive consultations. We receive consults from physicians, nurse practitioners. The two largest are East Tennessee Brain and Spine and Wellmont Pain are the two largest groups. Then there's another group, Associated Pain, and Dr. Dulabon and some other individuals uh, send, but those. East Tennessee Brain and Spine and, and Wellmont Pain are clearly the largest referrals. And I would think, you know, chronic pain is a huge issue. There are tons of patients like that. The core morbidity with all kinds of depression, anxiety, personality disorder. I heard one psychiatrist say, oh, 80% of all patient, pain patients have a personality disorder. I don't know that it's 80%, but it's pretty high, 20, 30, 40%. And certainly tons of them are depressed. And so you all, are, as psychiatrists, are going to get into the pain world, I would hope, and be asked for consults, advice, should we do this, and should we do Cymbalta or not Cymbalta? Or, you know, there should be a lot of going back and forth between pain and psychiatry and treatment outcomes and what do we do with this person. And, and uh, so hopefully it will be a part of your practice, whether you're prescribing opioids or not. There was a... Uh physician, Dr. Valley, Mark Valley, who worked with Cersei Pain, and which is by uh, where uh, Quillen Rehab Hospital is located now, or used to be. And uh, I was already seeing individuals, and I was scheduling people out for three months uh, that were referred. And that becomes a problem, because obviously people in pain want to be handled quickly, and, and that has other issues. But uh, he had just uh, started this practice with Cersei, and he called and said, I have some referrals, and ask how many. I said 600 consults, so, so we couldn't do that. But uh, there, there's clearly uh, been a need, and it's been active in terms of, uh, and apparently been doing this for seven years now. It seems to fulfill a need. Any other questions or comments? Well, that's why the BHI-2 is, I think, more helpful than the brief risk questionnaire in terms of getting a better sense of some of the personality uh, characteristics that relate to that. Now, you'll notice that there was one, um, you know, one um, uh, criticism said that malingering could be better assessed, but there are enough scales in terms of defensiveness. The symptom dependency scale in particular on the BHI-2 is a nice thing to look at. And of course, in, in the interview, I also want to get some sense of the person's general psychosocial assessment, get an idea of their legal history, and that sort of thing. Um, but uh, in terms of this particular scale, the symptom dependency scale, and uh, there's another one that relates to general stability and having a sense of fulfilling or not fulfilling life's goals that's helpful in terms of some of those. It's a big, it's not, there is an issue in terms of do I primarily identify as a pain patient? If I could snap my fingers and you never had any pain, what would happen? And how would you handle it? And so it, uh, I think the BHI2 at least gets at some of those questions. And it goes back and forth. You, you know, there's a number of people that have pain disorders and people say, well, I, I can't figure out what it is. You know, you're not, you're, your ANA is not positive or whatever, and, and we just don't know what it is. And so it's always unclear. Are they malingering? Do we not have the scans right to find it? And then you get the stories of later somebody did a, study, a scan or something and found it. And so that whole malingering thing, we, the staff told me they had one patient that got medicine and went out in the parking lot after his cane and threw his cane up in the air and twirled it. I was like, okay, we, we probably missed that one. Uh, I think as we...
quit prescribing high dose opioids, we get less of that because there's less reinforcement for trying to beat the system and I'm legitimate so I get a high dose. Well, if nobody's getting a high dose anymore, I think that's dropped off and they'll just go to heroin basically um, or Suboxone clinic. Um, so, but it's always tough to figure out. Suboxone clinic has had oh, yeah. some we'll controversy here recently. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Suboxone clinics are going to be the next thing to try to rein in because there's all kinds of shapes and sizes and we need to kind of get that down. Ted, you should understand Mountain States Health Alliance wants to establish a clinic in Gray. Oh, there, there's a ton of them. <laughs> so, yeah, yes. yeah. You got Steve Lloyd of the VA, I guess from Greenville, I think, is going to try to head a group to come up with guidelines about how, if you're going to run a buprenorphine clinic, what are you going to do? Uh, how does it look like? Shouldn't you have referrals and counseling and that kind of thing? Um, yeah, because apparently Suboxone is a terrible problem up here. East Tennessee is a huge problem for opioids, but apparently you all have got a unique Suboxone problem that uh, we don't understand as much down in our area. But uh, yeah, that'll be the next thing to wrestle with. Any other comments or questions? Okay. Thank you. Appreciate your attendance this morning.